Will you all pray with me? Holy One, I pray that you once again bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collective heart as we come together this blessed morning. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, may they simply be acceptable in your sight. Amen. So good morning, y'all, once again. Today is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost in what we call ordinary folks for you online. You might see the green vestment in our sanctuary, and I tend to go a little more casual. I don't wear a robe in the summer, much at all. That being said, good morning once again. So I was watching the morning news this week because I'm not very bright. <laughs> right? But there was a hopeful moment this week. It was a hopeful song of sorts amidst some awful, awful stuff. One of my favorite bands, kind of a single guy of sorts, I for fighting, and the voice behind that is of Vladimir John Andrasik the third. That's you wonder why he goes by five for fighting, right? He signed with EMI Records back in the day and adopted five for fighting as his name or the band's name the same year at the request of EMI Records, who found Vladimir Andrasik. A little difficult to pronounce. So five for fighting is the name. It's an ice hockey term, if you don't know. It's an expression that means a five-minute major penalty for participating in a fight. And he's a lifelong hockey fan of the National Hockey League's Los Angeles Kings, if you care. But he's recorded six full-length studio albums, one EP, and several live albums. Some of you may have heard the song Superman, nominated for a Grammy in 2002. And he's had songs featured in 350 films. You might hear them in soundtracks. But here are the words and images that kind of stopped me in my tracks. I was kind of covering from my booster shot this week. It was horrible. I can't play the clip, the YouTube videos <coughs> might yank my sermon later in the week, but you can pull it up, and I'll have Miranda put it in chat for you folks. Can one man save the world? And he performed this song with the Ukrainian orchestra in Kiev to raise awareness about the ongoing, we'll call it a conflict, Russian invasion of the war to our country. And proceeds from this performance are going to go towards aid for the nation. I'm going to read some of the press statement and then I'll read some lyrics. The song is inspired by the courage of President Vladimir Zelensky and the people of the Ukraine. Ask the nation and the world to stand up for core values of freedom and justice. And he has an honor to perform my new Ukraine tribute song, Can One Man Save the World, with the Ukraine Orchestra in the ruins of the Anatov Airport in front of the Ukraine's beloved Miria, the world's largest cargo plane that Russia destroyed at the outset of the war. And sharing this musical collaboration on such a hollow ground, I saw firsthand the fortitude and grace of the Ukrainian people, who, whether playing a violin, or driving a tank will not be deterred by Putin's atrocities and aggressions. Here are just a few of the lyrics. But I ask you to maybe close your eyes for a moment, kind of maybe softly or literally. And imagine John, just a man in his piano, amidst the rubble in the Ukraine, bodies, buildings, what was once beauty and busyness, and life, now death and destruction, one voice, a piano, an orchestra, symphony, playing beauty amidst horror, hope amidst atrocity, and loss, and this question being posed. Right? Can one man save the world? Now I guess I better pull up those lyrics that I thought I had on there. <laughs> Pause a moment.
Who is this comedian? His audience more nice than men. The Superman Ukrainian. I don't know. Great grandson of the Holocaust. An Easter heart. The West has lost. Nail or carry up his cross. I don't know. But he has everyone thinking. Yeah, he's got us all thinking. Can one man save the world in a thousand years? Will they say your name? Or is this all in vain? Can one man save the world? Will you take my hand? Will you help me stand? Still in the end, can one man save the world? I'm not going to say the rest of them. Right? This friend is another way which tables can be set up where they've been destroyed. Open your eyes and let us turn to our scripture from today slowly. Imagine you open the door to this scene from more than 2,000 years ago, because we're going back to the Hebrew scripture where God appeared to Abraham. I'm going to remind you, Abraham doesn't know this is God. The word Lord in this scripture does not mean God. It means someone foreign, someone with dignity, dignified, someone who is above you, but not necessarily God. He's sitting at the entrance of his tent. It was the hottest part of the day. He looks up and sees three men standing. He runs from his tent to greet them and bows down before them, as you would a foreign dignity at the time, saying, Master, if it pleases you, stop for a while with your servant. I'll get some water so you can wash your feet, as you would. Rest under this tree so that you'll be cool. I'll get some food. My wife will prepare it, of course, as you would, to refresh and then go on your way. Since your travels have brought you across my path, and of course, they oblige. Adam hurried into the tent to Sarah, saying, hurry, get three cups of our best flour, knead it, and make cakes of bread. Then Abraham runs into the cattle pen, picking up his nicest, best calf, and gave it to the servant who lost no time getting it ready, getting curds and milk, reminding you this is cheese, and brings it to them with the, again, nicest calf that he had roasted, and sets this benevolent, nicest meal before the men, and stands with them under the tree while serving them while they eat. And then the man says to them, where is Sarah, your wife? He reminds them she's in the tent. And one of them says to him, I'm coming back this way next year. When I arrive, what's going to happen? Your wife's going to have a son. Now, wait a minute. Sarah and Abraham are how old? We'll get back to that, right? They're old. They're old. Older than everyone in this room. Sarah's listening at the tent opening just behind the man. Abraham and Sarah are old, and Sarah laughs, right? <laughs> Sarah laughs at this. An old woman like me get pregnant with this old man of a husband? I'm going a little past the 10A. Is anything too hard for God? But Sarah lies. She says she didn't laugh because she was afraid. And he says, yeah, yeah, you laughed. And when the men get up to leave, they set up for Sodom. We know what happens in Sodom, right? That's not a great place. Their hospitality was not like Abraham's hospitality. And God says, shall I keep back from Abraham what I'm about to do? No, he says, Abraham is going to become a large and strong nation. All the nations of the world are going to find themselves blessed through him. I settled on him 
to be the one to train his children and future family to observe God's way of life, living kindly and generously and fairly so that God can complete in Abraham what is promised. It could be easy today for us, for me, to tie this scripture to the gospel. But there's two reasons why I'm not going to. We'd be here a while, right? And I'm unsure how fair that would be to us, right? To spend the afternoon here, right? But it's also unfair to the scriptures. This is Hebrew Bible, right? This belongs to a very Jewish set of people who aren't thinking about Christendom, right? And there is a theme of hospitality. It would be, it'd be okay to do that. There's a theme, we know this. Jesus and Mary are talking about this. It would be okay for us to do this. In fact, many pastors this morning are going to tie them together. But this morning, we can just focus on the Hebrew scripture. We're gonna talk about this meal that Abraham made for the guests that showed up on his doorstep today. Um, there's a book I read about, catch, it's called Catching Fire, How Cooking Makes Us Human. It's our humanity that connects us, right? What I find most stark and striking about this passage is the radical hospitality that occurs from the onset. When Abraham saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread to you that you may refresh yourself. And after that, you may pass on. How many of us would have foreign guests show up at our door, pass by our neighborhood on our property and would rush to meet them, right? People that I don't know, foreign dignitaries. I'm not sure what I would do, but I don't think I would rush to meet them. I would I might just kind of peer out my blinds. You know, if I saw a cargo come by with foreign dignities, I don't know what I would do, but I wouldn't ask to wash their feet. Abraham's behavior was not unusual for his time, certainly not in antiquity. It was required. But for us, it is jarring to read this text. There were rules and expectations and elaborate traditions specific to hospitality for how one might treat foreign travelers, period, in this time, right? That's not to say that we don't do things like this right now, <coughs> right? In a blizzard, if we were to see someone walking, we would probably pick them up, right? But overall, in general, most of us are hands off regarding strangers, right? How many of us tell our children, don't talk to strangers, right? When they're little, we say that. You know, Mr. Rogers says, find a friendly stranger, right? We find a policeman or a fireman or those kinds of things. Most of us don't welcome strangers into our home. I don't think anyone told my grandmother this. We had a lot of, we had a lot of people show up at our house. It was not, a strange thing on Sunday or Friday or Tuesday night to have someone odd at our dinner table. The make a place for Jesus was our thing. It didn't matter who they were or how they smelled. Let me tell you. <laughs> so Abraham never recognized that ultimately his guests were God and the angels or messengers of the Lord. And we don't really know in this text that they eat. We know that they prepared a meal, but we don't know whether or not that they actually ate. And I'll add here <coughs> that some scholars suggest that this is an early insight into the Trinity. And I'll, add, I'll say, I don't know what I think about this because that's a backward look into the text. We can say that this might be, but this is an imposition of Christianity into a very Jewish text. What we do know is that Abraham invites God to his table. And there is beauty in that. There is beauty in the hospitality that Abraham offers. Well, I do have critiques of Abraham later and what happens in his family. 
This is beautiful hospitality. His best calves, his best flower, his immediate offering to God is unlike Sodom, which is not a hospitable place to visit. Abraham is a very hospitable and hospitality driven family. So what, Pastor Monica? So what, right? But we know that Abraham and Sarah were in their 90s. They struggled with infertility. They both thought that time had passed them by and that their lineage was over. It was done. And they had ultimately made peace with that. Abraham and ultimately Sarah extended radical hospitality to strangers. Even though they probably had problems in their marriage, they probably were wounded people. They probably suffered with their own anxieties and depression, and yet they extended the table to people who passed them by. That radical table and shared meal led to the blessing and covenant that led to three Abrahamic religions. So the question that John or five for fighting can one man change the world? Yes and no, right? Can one act have an impact? Sure. Can one offer a kindness, change a person, and then that change change others? We've seen that. We know that on an afternoon of feeding the hungry, one offer of kindness can change the mood of a room. We know that. How might we recognize humanity in one another? We see those things when someone struggles with mental illness. We see those things in our own families. We understand how that happens. What if Abraham had not offered the table to those messengers? What if those messengers had simply passed them by? Would ultimately the divinity tradition not have been born? Who knows? But this is our story, and that became our song because that table was offered amidst the tent. And those feet were washed, the bread was offered, and ultimately a family was born to parents in their 90s. Friends, how might we recognize humanity in one another? Old bracelets, right? Lasagna, a little free pantry, many, many ways. How might we see these tiny moments that can change entire trajectories and civilization? A piano amidst a bunker that had been blown up? Can Vladimir, John, Andrzej III ask a question of us and make us ponder how we make changes in our own communities? Can one man change the world? I don't know. My friend, Greg Ellison asks this, how can I change the world? And he says, well, my grandmother says, I don't know about that, baby, but you can change three feet around you. And then those people are impacted. And then those people go change their three feet. And then those people go change their three feet. And little by little, three feet changes three feet, changes three feet. And then the world has changed three feet at a time. Dr. Ellison carries one of those, if you went to Ikea, and they have those little three feet measuring sticks that actually are paper and you put them in your pocket. He carries one of those with him to remind him that three feet is changing the world. So in fight for fighting says, can one man, or I say woman, change the world? I kind of get goosebumps watching that video of he and his piano and, and orchestra amidst a terrorized place. Because I think we can, but I think it takes boldness. I think it takes creativity because who would have imagined playing a piano amidst destruction? Who would imagine that we go to pride, this little church, 
built in 1857, right? But someone here had to have thought of that. Who would have imagined that we hand out those bracelets? Who would have imagined that we have a parade up and down the street waving our palms on Palm Sunday? But somebody did, right? And it impacted one person, at least, that we knew of. And that person's going to tell their story to somebody else. So I believe that one person can change the world. And I think we owe it to each other to try. Amen. Now.